Welcome back everyone to the channel. Tonight's terrifying video, I am giving you several allegedly true, horrifying, middle of nowhere stories. You be the judge. Now sit back, relax, dim those lights, and let's get spooky. Now, I uploaded a story recently that people seem to really enjoy. I decided to write this one after a lot of debate with friends and family, as it is more of an impact to my psyche and had an effect on the people around me. This story, and this story alone, brought me to therapy. For context for this story, I was going on a camping trip with my family members at the age of 10. They are all rather used to nature as they lived out in the sticks in Canada and all went camping regularly. Now we didn't go to any set campgrounds, but instead we decided to head out into the middle of the forest where my cousins had done days of laboring work ahead of time cutting down trees so we could fit an RV on our own private campground. In total, we were six people. The first night was rather normal, except for one point in the middle of the night. The sky was clear with the nice view of the stars overhead. We were sitting around a campfire, watching the flames burn and listening to the crickets and other forced noises. Then, at one point, we were in the middle of a conversation when I saw one of my cousins turning and twisting in his chair as he tried to get a good view of the tree line. We stopped our conversation immediately and our heads snapped to look at him. He turned to us and says, You guys hear that? We looked at each other and we focused on the sounds around us. I only heard the fire crackling, and that was the issue. The sounds of the forest completely stopped. Out of fear of a big animal approaching, my cousin rushed into the RV to get a gun while the rest of us followed. We waited for an hour or two in the RV, waiting for the sound of footsteps, but none came. The forest returned to its natural state and it was lively again. After that first night, we didn't get as much sleep as we were scared a bear or maybe a pack of wolves were going to come out. That would be the least of our issues, it seemed. But nevertheless, we continued to camp like nothing had happened. The next day, we were out on the lake fishing when we saw a few people dotting a small little island in the middle of it. It wasn't necessarily unnatural to see people out here, but what we were doing was technically illegal, so we didn't want a lot of people seeing what we were doing. But we continued to fish calmly as to not draw attention to ourselves. After 15 minutes or so of fishing, we saw a boat depart from that island and head directly towards us. We considered booking it, but we realized that it would make our presence seem more suspicious, so we waited. They eventually got to us, and there were two men in the boat. One of them was skinny and had a white tank top, jean shorts, and a blue cap and the other one was more plump and wore a camo vest with a white t-shirt underneath, matching jean shorts and the same blue cap. Hey, what are you guys doing out here? Said the skinny man, already sounding somewhat accusatory. We told him that we just drove out here today just for a day of fishing. Despite our somewhat normal story, they seemed to see through our charade. When the plump man interrupted my cousin and said, You guys didn't happen to know about that fire on the other side of this lake, do you? My cousin tried to lie and say that he had no clue and tried to confirm that we only got here this morning just to fish. After a few more lines of dialogue, they seemed to believe us and told us not to stay until nightfall as the 
animals are bad in the area. They turned their boat around and headed back to the island. Me and my cousin looked at each other thinking we dodged a bullet, but that bullet would still head directly towards us. That night, it happened. Four of my cousins decided to hunt through that night as they had made a custom hunting blind earlier that day. They took the weapons and headed out as me and my other cousin went to sleep for the night. I was listening yet again to the sounds of the forest and I was also listening when they started to fade away again. As they faded away, new sounds emerged in the night. Footsteps. Initially, I thought it was my cousins coming back from the hunt after getting something. But to my dismay, it wasn't. I heard someone say, Hey, you kids here? Even at such a young age, I could tell there was malicious intent behind those words. I slowly got out of my bunk bed and swiftly moved towards the closet window to ensure my dread was warranted. As I peeked out of it, I saw the same two guys from the boat and three people I had never seen before. Despite the change in apparel, I could tell it was them. As they walked into our campsite, they went to the two tents in front of the RV where we kept some extra supplies. They barely looked inside before all of them turned to the RV and slowly stepped over to it. I tried to silently bolt over to my cousin to try to get his help and wake him up. But when I started shaking him awake, he said loudly, Leave me alone, it's in the middle of the night. That triggered a chain of events I only thought would be possible in my nightmares. Immediately after saying that, these guys started banging on the RV, telling us to open up and unlock the door. The second they started doing this, my cousin woke up fast and ran over to the kitchen and opened a drawer to find some kitchen knives. We got far away from the door and waited for the banging to stop. When it did, the door flew outward and we finally saw the three guys stomp into the RV. They slowly looked around the cramped RV and stopped when they finally caught our gaze. Our fear was obvious. There was no mistaking it for any other emotion. We had no power here. The skinny man from earlier walked over to us and my cousin swung his knife at him. It cut his hand a little, but he got adrenaline from it and ripped the knife from his hand and it fell on the ground. We were defensiveless. So when they grabbed me and put me on my feet and forced me out of the RV, all I could do was scream and struggle. They gripped me by the collar of my shirt as they led us deeper into the forest in the middle of the night. I tried to scream, but they put their hand over my mouth. I looked over at my cousin who had the same thing happen to him. We couldn't do anything. The guys were laughing and joking around like this was any normal situation for them. As we walked deeper into the forest, the less we tried to struggle. We nearly gave up when, finally, my cousin bit the hand of the one man and was able to let out one more shriek. After grunts of pain, the guy immediately punched my cousin in the face to keep him quiet and put his hand back over his mouth. We were getting close to the lake when finally we heard a loud crack. One of the guys blurted out, Gunshot! They were clearly confused when we heard two more gunshots ring out. The guys let go of us and we heard my cousins yelling at them. It was almost incoherent to me, purely from the suddenness of it. Our captors ran off into the forest, leaving us standing there in shock. Our cousins came over and assisted us back to the camper van. I was shaking and shivering despite it being a warm night. I tried to talk, but I could only shake my head and nod. We left that night, 
and I wasn't able to sleep well for weeks after the occasion. Thinking of what would have happened if my cousin wasn't able to make that noise that drew my cousins back to us? We told the local officers in the end and told them about it, risking the fine for technically camping illegally. In the end, they never found the guys, and we haven't heard from the police since. So guys, be careful out there. Make sure you know the area and what is around you. Always stay cautious. For context, my tribe specifically is the Kickapoo tribe. We were spread out through Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Mexico. I have family everywhere, but I live in Oklahoma. Our tribe still practices its ceremonies. That is to say, it's all taught old school. Outsiders are not welcome and nothing is written down. And we have several tribal members who don't even speak English or know anything about what's going on around the world. Anyways, when I was young, there was a ceremony that had to take place in Mexico every year. All families essentially had to make a trip down there. Out of respect for my tribe, I won't include exactly what happens, but it shouldn't matter. All that you need to know is that my grandmother has a house down there that my relatives rally at. There is a lot of us. More than a house can hold. Luckily, it's relatively cheap to build over there. So my grandmother had a similar house built on the same property. My family, my aunt's family, and my uncle's family were there. My grandmother is a superhero, so she is helping another group of family with their ceremony, since the knowledge is all oral, and my mom had all of ours handled. The entire reservation in Mexico is located in the middle of nowhere, about four hours drive from Eagle Pass. And once you get there, it's another two hours until you get to the property. It's really big, and there are mountains within walking distance. My grandmother's houses are actually at the foot of one. There is no, There are no good stories that involve those mountains. They are considered a taboo place. We don't go up there except to hunt. A ceremony must be done for your protection if you have to go. I was maybe eight or nine at the time. My aunt lives in Texas, and my sisters and I don't get to see our cousins very much. So these trips were the closest thing we had to family vacations, even though there were nothing but long work days. We would laugh and laugh. There was no electricity over there. As someone who grew up pretty close to Oklahoma City, I sometimes forgot how dark it could be when there are no cities nearby. No lights on the horizon. No cars on the road. Just finding the two small houses on the property could be difficult if no one has fires going. There is a small window in each room that is barred and the doors are all made of steel. It's not pretty, but it's necessary since no one lives in these houses most of the year. The new house is different. The windows are still barred, but they can open. The old house windows are just solid glass. My sisters and I were playing with my cousin E and M in the new house. M is my age and E is two years younger. It was well after sundown and the headlights of my uncle's truck was the only light. It was getting late and we, I say we, but reality just my parents, had a long day of work the next day, so everyone started moving for lights out. My family was in the old house, so my sisters and I headed to our room. It happened that night. I woke up to screams. So did everyone else. You would think I would have been panicked, but no. 
I was a kid who just got woken up by was clearly E screaming at the new house. I wanted to yell at him to shut up. I wasn't scared until my dad, very strong and quiet, walked into our room and told us to stay. We didn't disobey my dad, so we did. We went to the window and tried to watch. My dad was talking to my aunt and my uncle, along with some of my much older cousins, were walking up and down the fence on our property with flashlights. It was too dark to see anything else. After an hour or so, we started getting tired, so we went back to sleep, but the adults were awake until sunrise. I tracked E and M down to try to find out what happened. E wouldn't talk about it, and M didn't know. He said E saw something through the window. We all got a little creeped out. On this last day, I asked my cousin G. G was one of the cousins who was walking up and down the fence that night. And as a kid, he was something of a hero to me. He was a genuine tall muscled badass native with the dead stare and everything. He told me what had happened since my sisters weren't around. Apparently, it had been hot in the new house, so my cousins had opened all the windows. E was sleeping on the floor next to one and was awoken by something touching his face. An old, pale, naked woman was sticking her head through the bars and was looking down at him. Her hair was long and gray, and it was what woke him. He said she was smiling. Being even younger than me, he screamed and screamed until everyone came. After that, they looked around but never found anything. I was creeped out, but I'm pretty sure E had just had a bad dream. So here I am years later. I haven't gone back to Mexico or Texas in a long time. I'm not really involved in the traditional part of my tribe anymore. My sisters have kind of taken over now. I still help when I can, but I have a pretty busy job. I discovered no sleep a few weeks ago and thought about what had happened with E way back and thought it might make a good story. Just out of curiosity, I called my mom to ask about it. Surely, I wasn't the only one who had thought E had just had a bad dream. Why did everyone take him so serious? I really wish I hadn't because now I have this feeling in my stomach when I think about it. She told me, this wasn't the first time the old woman had been seen. And G was wrong. They found her bare footprints going from the window to the fence heading towards the mountains. Judging from the footprints they had found, she had visited every window on the property. It's in the middle of nowhere in the pitch black. What the hell? Even in the oppressive twilight, the woods around us were alive, animated by the primal rhythms of nature. When we were children, my sister and I often ventured into this seemingly endless expanse of trees, our shared sanctuary away from the mundane. But that was before, before the elusive beast, before the vanishing before the dread took root and started to grow. It's been a year now since Tessa vanished. The news hit me like an ice wave, freezing my insides and leaving me numb. I remember the sheriff's face, his eyes hidden behind mirrored sunglasses, his lips spitting words like disappear, search, hopes. I remember the sinking sensation, my heart plummeting in my chest like a stone in deep waters. The evidence pointed towards something unnatural. Locals whispered about a creature stalking the woods, an entity shrouded in shadows and legend, nightmarish tales of a beast that could mimic human form 
ensnaring the unsuspecting. An outrageous fable, yet in the marrow chilling cold of my desperation, I was ready to believe it all. So here I was at the mouth of the forest, staring into the impenetrable veil of greenery, ready to confront the unknown. The forest, once familiar, now seemed like a labyrinth hiding unnameable horrors. The investigation was a tedious dance of tedium and terror. With every breaking twig under my boot, with every sudden rustle of the leaves, the fabric of reality seemed to warp. Shadows appeared to undulate, reaching out with phantom limbs, and every hoot of an owl sounded like a call of doom. But I pushed on, driven by the dim beacon of hope, the belief that Tessa was still alive. Days melted into each other as I ventured deeper, the beast of uncertainty gnawing at my sanity. The oppressive forest loomed, an inescapable wall closing in. The illusion of time lost its grip and a new, twisted reality set in. Every heartbeat was a loud drum of time, every breath a life-giving rhythm, every step a mile into uncertainty. In my wanderings, I found an abandoned house halfway swallowed by the surrounding wilderness, a relic from another time. The structure creaked under its age, its timbers groaning tales of better days. Pushing the door open, the scent of decay and neglect assaulted me. Cobwebs shrouded corners, dust laid thick on the furniture, and a chill crept up my spine. This was a place suspended in a forgotten epic, a crypt for memories and secrets. Yet, the discovery that awaited me was as shocking as it was miraculous. Tessa. She was there, huddled in a corner, her eyes mirroring the fear I had been suppressing. An eruption of joy warred with a sense of disquiet, a dichotomy of emotions that I was ill-prepared the process. And then, the seed of dread sprouted. She didn't answer my barrage of questions, didn't acknowledge my presence. There was an odd blankness to her, a disturbing hollowness that made my pulse quicken. In a chilling instant, her face shifted, morphing into something monstrous, a grotesque mask that was a parody of my sister. I stumbled back, the reality of it hitting me like a freight train. In the end, the legends were not just tales. The beast wore my sister's face. For a moment, my mind grappled with the reality of what I was witnessing. My sister, or the creature wearing her guise, stood before me, its grotesque transformation compelling my heart into a frantic dance of terror. The familiarity of her face warped into an uncanny nightmare. The walls of the dilapidated house seemed to close in, the very air thickening with an unnameable dread. I could almost taste my fear, a bitter melange that hung on my tongue like a forbidden secret. This creature, this mimic, was an affront to reality, a paradox that my mind was desperate to reject. Yet denial was a luxury I couldn't afford. I was caught in this macabre dance, the chilling waltz of survival. I watched as the beast shifted her, its, face rippling like disturbed water, twisting into a terrible parody of the human form. She, it, did not attack immediately. The beast, cloaked in my sister's skin, seemed content to watch, its gaze lingering on me with an unsettling intensity. Its intentions were as unfathomable as the heart of the force that had hidden it. That's when I realized. The creature was playing a game. This is the way it hunted, 
by wearing a familiar face, luring the unsuspecting into its snare. The stories of the beast taking human form weren't just tales spun around the embers of a campfire. They were desperate warnings. A flash of realization spun through my terror. The house, the endless woods, the rumors of the beast, all pieces of a deadly puzzle I was forced to solve. I had walked into the trap, lured by the desperate hope to finding my sister. Instead, I had found a monster dooming her face. The mimic was waiting, patient as a grave, for me to make the next move. My thoughts raced. The adrenaline pumping through my veins threatened to hijack my senses. I needed a plan, a desperate gambit to escape from the beast's lair. But every idea seemed as futile as trying to catch smoke. The beast was a predator in its domain, and I, the unwary prey. My gaze fell onto the splintered window, the only visible exit. The gamble was risky, but the alternative was certain death. The beast, masked by the illusion of my sister, continued its vigil, seemingly amused by my eternal struggle. With every beat of my heart echoing like a war drum in my ears, I made my move. I lunged towards the window, a desperate dive into uncertainty. Glass shards rained around me as I burst through the window, an explosion of fear and determination. In the relative safety of the forest, I could hear the beast's enraged howl, a sound that echoed through the woods like an unholy curse. I dared not to look back. The image of my sister's face twisted into a monstrous facade was forever etched into my memory. The forest around me, once a sanctuary, now felt like an intricate trap, a labyrinth designed to confuse and instill fear. But I didn't falter. With the monstrous echo of the beast's fury spurring me on, I plunged deeper into the labyrinth's woods. The night began to close in, the darkness an ally and an enemy. I was lost in the wild labyrinth, my hopes dwindling with every rustle of the undergrowth, every snap of a twig under unseen feet. Yet, I clung to my will to survive, a beacon cutting through the shroud of despair. Despite the shadows that threatened to engulf me, despite the monstrous replica of my sister that lurked somewhere behind me, I clung to a sliver of hope, a threadbare lifeline in the abyss of dread. The night was far from over, and I was far from giving up. As night fell, the forest morphed into a terrain of shadows and half-imagined specters. Each rustling leaf, each hoot of an owl echoed the terror coursing through my veins. The forest had transformed into a sentient entity, a beast lying in wait, its heart pounding with the rhythm of my own fear. But I had to press on. I felt like a ghost drifting through the otherworldly landscape, the moon cloaked behind clouds, offering no solace. Every tree loomed like a skeletal sentinel, their bare branches reaching out like a gnarled fingers trying to pull me into the earth. The darkness around me was so absolute that it felt like a tangible force, a presence that laughed at my disorientation. But fear, as paralyzing as it was, honed my senses. My ears seemed to pick up on every rustle of leaves, every whistling gust of wind that shook the towering trees. Each noise was a potential threat, a possible sign of the beast in pursuit. There was a sound, a low growl. The chill that swept through me was colder than the night air. It was here. I was being hunted. Desperation drove my body forward, my feet thudding against the damp forest floor. My lungs burned, but fear was a relentless master. 
I felt the presence closing in, the boundary between predator and prey blurring with each frantic heartbeat. Suddenly, there was light. A sliver of hope slicing through the unforgiving dark. The edge of the forest was near. I could make it. I had to. The last shred of my energy drained into those final pivotal moments. My body propelled itself towards that beacon of hope. The world seemed to tilt. The sounds of the forest merging into a disorientating symphony of fear. I emerged from the oppressive shadows, stumbling onto the deserted highway. The world seemed different, bathed in the harsh white glare of the moon. The beast's roars faded into silence, the boundary of the forest a barrier that it couldn't cross. Behind me, the forest loomed like a monstrous entity, its secrets cloaked in darkness. But here I was, out of its grip, still haunted but alive. The cruel game had ended, or so it seemed. My story serves as a warning to those who venture into the heart of the unknown. The forest still stands, a silent enigma bearing the scars of my harrowing ordeal. It waits patiently for the next player, the beast lurking in its depths. And the missing? They're just players in this deadly game ensnared in the labyrinth of fear. My sister was never truly found, but the memory of her is no longer tainted by the beast's deception. The mimic took her form, not her spirit, and that in itself is a victory. In the end, I carry the weight of this chilling experience, the echoes of my fear serving as a constant reminder. I bear the invisible scars of that night, the horror seared into my memory. I peered into the heart of terror and lived to tell the tale. I am a survivor. And the forest, with its beast, remains an unanswered enigma, a puzzle waiting for its next player. The game is far from over. I couldn't believe I had even agreed to do it, but if it would make Mel happy, I would do anything. The experience was advertised as a haunted cave tour by Lantern Light, and even though I had never been one to believe in the supernatural, I wouldn't have doubted it here. It looked terrifying just from the pictures online. Extremely cramped spaces that they force you to crawl through at one point. Sections with uncomfortably low visibility. And terrifyingly vast caverns that seemed to have impossibly high ceilings. It was everything she loved. It was a bit of a drive away from the city. But the scenery made up for its beauty. Twisting roads lined with pine trees leading our ascent higher into the Rockies. The cave was tucked away into the side of a towering mountain, a series of large log cabins next to its entrance. The air was pure and refreshing up here, eminent the moment we stepped out of the car. I took a moment to savor it, knowing we would soon be deep within the earth. We stopped at the main building, where we exchanged our tickets for a lantern that was to be shared between us. It was bustling with activity, kids running around the gift shop screeching with joy. Just a reminder, at some points during the experience, your light will be turned off for a moment. The woman behind the counter said with a smile, Don't panic when it happens. It's just part of the experience. It'll come back on. I picked up the object and took a moment to observe it noting how there were no obvious way to open any of the panels or turn the light on or off. We picked up some guide pamphlets on the counter and made our exit out of the cabin, following the trail to the cave's entrance. How do you think they're going to turn it off? Mel asked, 
staring at it, swinging between us as we walked. Look at it. It's not an actual lantern. There's probably just a light bulb they could control with it, like Bluetooth or something, I said. We stood before the mouth for a second before entering. As if listening, the light turned on. I had never experienced claustrophobia until the moment I stepped into the cave. Cold wind rushed through my ears, overwhelming my senses. Stalactites loomed overhead, casting long shadows that blended into the ever-present darkness that consumed every direction. Small lights lined the rocky walls, offering just barely enough light to make out the entrance and our immediate surroundings beyond what the lantern reached. I tried to imagine the children from the gift shop struggling to keep calm in here. We stood idly by a large sign marked the beginning of the tour. A few stragglers loitered close by, frequently checking the time on their phones. It was meant to have started a few minutes ago, but I guess they could just be running late. I'm going to go run to the bathroom real quick. Be right back. Mel nudged me playfully, already turning to leave. Hurry up, we might leave without you, I teased. She turned and rolled her eyes at me before stepping out of the mouth of the cave, speed walking to the cabins. I felt even more uncomfortable standing there alone, feeling as though the walls would cave in and collapse on top of me. Feeling overwhelmed, I stared down at the lantern weighing down on my right hand, watching how it illuminated the stalagmites circling me. I watched the shadows dance as a large figure shifted behind me. How much longer are y'all thinking it'll be? The place has already given me the creeps, said one of the men who had been standing nearby, now closer to me. He looked equally as nervous as I felt. I hadn't noticed him before, which was surprising given the large stature of the man. His fingers toyed with the crease pamphlet in his hands. Hopefully not too long. It hasn't even started yet, and I'm starting to feel the same way too, honestly. It felt good to know someone else shared my fears. Do you know how long the tour's gonna last? He thought for a moment, glancing down at the pamphlet. It's supposed to only be about 45 minutes, but apparently their dark chamber attraction tends to draw it a little bit longer. At least, that's what it says. I felt my pocket for my own copy tugging the crumpled paper out. A map of the whole cave system sprawled across three pages, each one highlighting some of the main attractions in the different sections. The dark chamber was marked towards the end, a huge feature taking up most of the page. Traverse through our darkest chamber with only one light to guide you. Stay close to the wall. Stay close to your guide. They lurk in the center. They? Who's they? Did you see the last line in the description? I don't know. I think it's part of the bit they tell the kids where they... So sorry about that, folks. A lanky man made his way over to our group. My last tour went a bit over, but I'll be sure to make it up to y'all. His voice bounced off the walls as he spoke, amplifying the volume. I glanced behind me to see Mel running just in time. The tour guide smiled. All right, let's go over some basic safety procedures. Most of the tour was uneventful. We wandered through different sections of the cave system, listening to recountings of its history and local legends. Fortunately, most of the things highlighted on the website had been exaggerated, like the passage you have to crawl through were actually just areas you had to slightly duck to get through. Our light did flicker quite a few times, much to our amusement. The tour guide would allude to something supernatural, and on cue, they would flicker or turn off for a moment. Despite a lot of the tour being a bit cheesy, the tunnels themselves were eerily beautiful. Deep, cavernous ridges and the rock-like claw marks decorating the walls. Our lanterns illuminated sparkling minerals and revealed giant sprawling caverns full of history. There were roped-off areas with hanging employees-only signs, 
though beyond the rope was always pitch black nothing. So many sections were blocked off that made me a bit uncomfortable, though I suppose I didn't have any other caving experiences to compare it to. Any time we stood close to them, I always felt like something might try to grab me from the darkness, just waiting for me to move over just close enough for them to pounce. It was also just so cold throughout the entire cave system, and it seemed to just get colder the further we pressed on. Overall, though, we were both really enjoying the whole experience so far. Until we reached the passageways leading to the dark chamber. You know, the legends claim something roams through these caves. The guide spoke lowly, his baritone voice reverberating off the walls. Apparently, the first people to ever find these caves went missing. For a long time, we thought the system was discovered in 1947. It wasn't until we began having expeditions deeper into the cave that their corpses were discovered, along with papers dating to 1912. He spoke with a voice that reminded me of a camp counselor telling ghost stories. Another group was also discovered from 1923. While they had long since decomposed, there was something strange about their remains. Their clothes they wore were completely tattered, with long, jagged gashes of ripped blood stained in their place. The rocks surrounding them were also etched with long, frantic scratch marks. This is a bit dramatic for a children's gimmick, isn't it? I raised my eyebrows at Mel for her input, but she merely shrugged in response. He continued talking as we walked through more of the narrow passageways leading up to the attraction. It was surreal being down here with so little light. We were completely reliant on our lanterns. I gripped the handle on mine tightly. There was a path that was so narrow that we had to walk single file to pass through. The guide's voice being completely inaudible until we made it to the other side. All right. For this section, I'm going to need you all to pay close attention. How this works is that we are all holding on to a rope to connect us all. We're about to navigate through the dark cavern, a place where almost no light penetrates, including our lanterns. Luckily, mine seems to allow to stay on, he said with a wink. It'll only last about a minute. For your safety, please hold on tightly to the rope and stay close to the wall. This is so performative, Mel chuckled. How much you think the kids are going to freak out? My cheeks flushed as the people turned to look at us. I elbowed her lightly. We began filing into a neater line, then they began passing the rope back. The guide's voice was mostly unintelligible so far ahead of us, but he seemed to still be talking about safety protocols. The man I had spoken to before shuffled in front of me. The rope finally reached him, our hands brushing as he shakily handed the end of it to me. I looked up for a moment and recoiled, shocked by the look of genuine worry on his face, sweat glimmering on his skin despite the temperature of the cave. I wanted to say something, anything, but the people ahead of us began moving forward. Hurriedly, I passed Mel the end of the rope and gripped tightly to the remaining section in my hands. Remember to stay close. The guide's voice echoed off the walls. I watched his headlights slowly disappear into the darkness. We passed through the entrance into the section, crossed under the sign warning of danger ahead. In an instant, I was plunged into darkness. With the complete absence of light, it was impossible to see anything. Whether my eyes were open or closed, the same view greeted me, an oppressive black void that threatened to swallow me whole. Wind shuddered like cold breath against my neck. I wanted to collapse into myself. The rope tugged me forward. I felt my legs unwillingly move with it, forcing myself to keep going. My shoulders scraped and dragged against the jagged wall. I blindly followed the person in front of me, cursing myself for ever agreeing to do this. 
I felt the rope ahead of me veer slightly to the right, then immediately fall limp. A wave of panic washed over me, fearing it somehow got cut, yet I kept being pulled forward. Without letting go of my own grip, I slid my palms up the coarse rope, trying to feel for the man. It burns and skins my hands as I bend myself awkwardly to extend my arm as far as possible. Yet it just kept going, never bumping into another person. The guide's headlamp disappeared into an abyss of light ahead of us. Relief washed over me as I see the end in sight, my legs desperately pulling forward to get back to the surface. Blinding light temporarily shocked me as I emerged back into the entrance. My eyes struggled to adjust, but between blinking I saw the empty space in front of me. Before I began to say anything, we were being ushered out of the cave. The guide collects the end of the rope from Mel and corals us like a herding dog to the exit. Alright, looks like that's everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed the tour. Please be sure to check out the gift shop and explore the other activities we have around here. Thank you all and come back soon. He seemed eager to get us to leave. I suppose it was due to time constraints, thinking of what the man had said to me earlier. I looked around for him once more, trying to spot his face amongst the crowd of us leaving, yet I still don't see him anywhere. We find ourselves back inside the gift shop. In between looking at tacky knickknacks, I find myself looking towards the door each time the bell chimes, hoping to see the man walk in at any point. I just can't remember seeing him leave. Hey, do you think the guy in front of us during the rope bit was part of the tour? I still haven't seen him anywhere. I think he might have snuck out or something to scare us. I said, turning the mail. What? Who are you talking about? She barely looks up from the shelf she was looking at. You know, the guy in front of me when we were in the chamber. He completely disappeared while we were in there. He must have gone through one of those employee-only areas or something. She finally turns to face me. Eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Steph, there was a woman in front of us the whole time. 